right. Uh, once again, welcome to another No Gi Required podcast. And once again, I have uh, Mike in charge of everything. My partner here, Professor Jay Zabalos. Happy holidays. Yes, happy holidays. And um, I think like uh, one of the greatest thing in our podcast is every guest that we bring over here has something special to share with us. Today I have one of my students and friends, Jonathan Schechter. Did I say right? You did. Perfect. Oh, man. And I think he has uh, a lot of things that he will share for us. If I'm not wrong, it's not many people know about it. But I think it's, uh, to me, it's just a great message for a lot of people out there. They'll be hear from him on his own side of his story. But I want to start with uh, your company, man. I was mentioned to you, and I like the introduction as a boutique. That's a lot. Yes, sir. Very Company, special. Man, can you can you go through that with us? And because uh, I saw a lot of things there. Man, give us some idea. Well, thank you for having an interest, and uh, really, thanks for for letting me join you guys. I mean, of I, course, this is a very special treat for me. I feel privileged to be able to be here and have this conversation. Um, yeah, so, by trade, uh, I'm an attorney. <clears throat> I wear a few different hats, uh, but I started my own law firm. 12 years ago, which focuses on business law and business advisory services. And uh, it's based in New York. I moved here from New York uh, three and a half years ago. Time, time flies. And um, basically, we service companies, private, all the way through public and everything from corporate law, capital raising, mergers and acquisitions, everything day to day related. We take companies public. Um, and uh, we basically do that under the auspice of a, a boutique firm. So yeah, it sounds to me when I read that is like something really special that I would have full attention from the whole team, and I felt like, man, I want to be part of that. That's I good. Be in that club, <laughs> that means our message is uh, is getting across well. So thanks for taking a look at it. Uh, yeah, so that's that's most of what we do. Um, in addition, uh, I'm a, I'm an investor in some private companies, primarily technology companies. And before moving here, I was also a professor at Fairleigh Dickin University, uh, teaching entrepreneurship in the law. So basically teaching third year college students about everything from how to start your own business and what the strategy should be like and what your marketing and branding should, should take place. And, and as we mentioned before, and I ask you, let me, I know we are very small into that aspect, but all of us that loves martial arts and we want to have the dream to open a school. I know it's something really small compared and I believe with the companies and the firms that you're dealing with. What would be like uh, some kind of basic steps of somebody who wants to, I don't know, run a martial arts school, basically jiu-jitsu school that you see could be very helpful because we're pretty good in jiu-jitsu. <laughs> but when it comes down to the business, a lot of schools, unfortunately, live month to month or sure. sometimes not even survive. Yeah, yeah. 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 Especially in this environment. Uh, yeah. The most challenging environment I could possibly imagine for having a martial arts school and what you have done and, and professor Jay and Mark and everyone here is just absolutely incredible how you navigated the most horrific period, um, you know, in, in recent history for a martial arts school and how to, how to transact at least in business. And I don't know, and, and in a way, when you when I read the, uh, all the profile of your company, things that you do, and when I stick with that word boutique, I felt like a um, part of something. And I think it captures me is kind of a respond and translate with that whole year and a half that we've been going, still mm -hmm. going on right now. It's, I think, the way we treat our students, literally... Our academy became so, so what each one is so special. Each one is very important to the academy. It's not only the school does a good service too, but I think the students add so much into the academy. And here we are, a year and a half later, we're still going strong. Uh, we have our ups and downs like we're doing life. But I think uh, if you can and you say, if somebody out there wants to, reinvented or would say open a school today what would be the first i don't know couple steps that you can see that they can do well martial arts school or any small business really it, it's going to be the same 
analysis as far as I'm concerned. There's distinguishing factors with the martial arts school in, that may be different from in other. In a way, it's like the different product yeah. that we're providing or right. serving. And, and so you're providing a service, right? The product happens to be jujitsu, but primarily I would characterize uh, a martial arts academy as a service business. Your product happens to be the best product that, that I could imagine in martial arts, but you're providing the service. And you had mentioned how the last year and a half really you're coming out of this, or at least we're hoping that you're coming out of this uh, in a very good position vis-a-vis -vis other martial arts academies. And I think the reason that that is, is because you've answered probably the first question that I would ask myself if I'm about to start a business, which is, why am I starting it? And I think, I think your reasoning, Jean-Jacques and, and Jay, is, you know, you have a very clear grasp of why you wake up every morning and why you come here and who you want to teach and who you want to work with and, and what kind of environment you want to build. And so if you don't have a strong answer to that question of why I'm doing why I'm doing, I don't think there's going to be that, you know, having a business is a grind day in and day out, no oh. matter if you love it or not, it's a grind. And you need to wake up and understand why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and so I wouldn't recommend for anybody to start a business unless they know exactly why. And it's a very good reason for them to, to motivate them day in and day out. And I want to go back and, and ask you, you already been practicing Jiu-Jitsu for several years. Recently, you got promoted as a purple belt. Yeah, one just, of my just one of my it. best guys wow. over here. Mm -hmm. I mean, as as most of the students feel shocked, like, well, me mm, today. Absolutely. But I think is uh, every day that people show up in the class, it's kind of to me is like a a test. How often they come, how much they want, how much they're producing, how enthusiastic. Then I mean, it shows a lot of other things, because in terms of just the technique, most of the guys already have the level of. But as somehow from the school that I come from, we always expect a little more of the students, especially on the environment and see him succeed in their lives and come into the school and smile. So many little things involved. I'm not even sure how do I, can I explain that. It's the way that was brought up in my gen prior generations. And, and I think it's been very successful in that aspect because I feel people feel surprised. Somehow we get that strength but when was your first experience in martial arts so my first experience in martial arts is probably the first bruce lee movie i saw i'm guessing much like most oh, people yep, yep. Um, that's my <laughs> first taste of it and my childhood was a little bit different so i moved around a lot when i was younger and uh that was mainly due to the fact that my dad who's in medical research, and we'll come back to that important part of the, of the story a little bit later, uh, would go basically where the grant money is. Um, so in medical research, you either move forward or you die. Uh, probably very similar to other businesses oh, in life. For sure. Um, and so I grew up in Israel, actually. I was born here in Los Angeles, but when I was eight or nine months old, I moved to Israel. And that's where I spent most of my youth. And Israel is known... Um, among other things, at least the two products that emerged from there are the two, the two passions are soccer and judo. And so I think my parents got tired of me walking around the house and <laughs> kicking everybody and practicing roundhouse on my mom in the kitchen and said, you're going to judo. So I went to judo and I loved it. I loved it. I had a great experience and, uh, I would, I got my first gi and I was super excited and, I did it for about a year, and judo in the 80s, um, the instructors didn't have the em emotional intelligence that I think a lot of instructors have today. And so the warmth and the attention to the students is not quite the same level as it is here. And one day, um, the instructor wanted to demonstrate a, a throw, and I've been around for about a year, so I, I knew more or less what was going on. And so he takes me, he decides, you come to the front and um, let me demonstrate on you. So he shows a little bit of the technique that's about to happen. And then I, 
I see it as less than 60 seconds. I think less than, excuse me, less than a second. I was over his shoulder, just on my back, clueless about what just happened. And I had enough muscle memory to block the, the fall. So I, I remember to do that, but the air was knocked out of me. I was... And that was just a demonstration. And this was just a demonstration. It was just whoosh, right over the shoulder. And I went home and I never came back to that wow. class ever again. Um, which, by the way, I regret very, very much. Um, I, I don't know if it's because of... I mean, I was scared. That's obvious. But I think my trust and confidence of what was going on there was probably shattered to bits. So I, I never came back after yeah, it was, that. I guess was a, in a way, traumatic experience and evidently has to do with how the instructor would handle and, and yes. approach you. It's like, oh, okay, maybe if it was uh, his fault, I guess he could just bring you in and maybe call you, hey, what's up? we're missing you, Jonathan, come yeah. back. Yeah. But based on that, and I think... Uh, we're going to go back to jiu-jitsu, but one of the greatest things in, in having the chance to have a podcast is to have people telling their stories. And I think to me is everyone that comes to our podcast to me is a very important person. I treat like, a, for me, it's like you're a celebrity now because I'm talking to you. I'm going to ask you about personal things in your life. And, and I think it's the fact that you're sharing a lot of those things I'm sure a lot of people that are listening to us right now will, a lot of people might be related to that because we are all real people. You are the real guy. You went through some tough times in your life and you, you came out on top. If you can, I'd like you to, to share that experience with, um, with us, evidently. Man, you are a cancer survivor. I that am. Is, uh, <coughs> yep. Yeah, I'm a cancer survivor. Um, and, and, Somehow, the more I think about it over time, kind of that experience of going through cancer was one of the, one of the greatest things that, that happened to me. Um, and I, I've actually heard a few survivors frame it in that way um, over time. So I, at least I know I'm not alone in that. But um, basically what, what happened was I, I had finished, um, we had moved around. And I had ultimately gone to school in Maryland at the University of Maryland. And I was about to graduate. And uh, you were like, what, 20 years old? I'm 20. I'm a little bit older. Um, I was a terrible, terrible student. Terrible student in high school. I can't describe how bad I was. I had absolutely no attention, no focus. And um, kind of pre, pre-cancer, um, one of the first advers- uh, adversities or difficult times I'd gone through is really this experience of just not being able to do anything at school. And uh, somehow I got into a college in Indiana. I went there, I flunked out, I came back home, and I ended up going to a community college near my parents' house, and I'm 19 now. And I don't know exactly what happened, uh, but something just clicked and I realized that I was starting to understand how to learn, like how to study something. And I realized that I have to work a lot harder than most people. Like for me, maybe somebody picks up a math book or a history book and they can read a page and they get it. I need to sit down. I need to have notes well, fi- finally, I find somebody like me, man. Oh, <laughs> me I have too. a hard yeah, time. Me too. I have to read the same thing several times. Like, oh, okay. I yeah. <laughs> I, I have to be like in a zone. And when I say in a zone, I literally mean like get into a zone where I'm flowing, like a flow state learning. Um, so it took me a lot longer, but I had to grind it out and grind it out and work. And I ended up doing really well at the community college. And then I ended up getting into the University of Maryland and ended up getting into their business school. And nothing changed. I mean, I still had to work my, my ass off. I, sorry for the language, but oh, no, I had to work no, very, very hard to, to get it done. And that was really the first kind of difficult, aside from moving. And listen, everybody has their own story. Yeah, we all have yeah. a yeah, yeah. Our personal challenge. And yeah. But uh, we, we make it. But we make it, yeah. You, and you did it. Yeah. So I grinded through 
college took me a little bit longer because I had to go through that process of multiple schools, but ended up doing really, really, really well. And um, I'm about to graduate and I decide I'm taking time off. I'm going to Europe, plan this trip with zero dollars. I said, I'm going to go backpacking through Europe, kind of cliche, but I wanted to do yeah. it. And, um, and two months after I graduate, I'm, I'm, I'm a month away from leaving and um, I discover a lump in one of my testicles. And I go, oh, what's that, right? I talked to my dad the next day and I mentioned this to him and I don't know what, what he did, but he's like, meet me at this address in 30 minutes. And before I know it, I'm at a, a doctor's office and they're doing scans. Later that evening, phone call, there's a, there's a, there's something there. There's a lump there. And I go, oh, okay. So when and you, you know, we're, we're talking about you're like 20 years old. I'm 20, 20, 22 years old, 22 years old. Yeah. Once you find out and, and I have the curiosities, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you find out something like that? Blank, blank comes to mind because the, the pace and the mission is so automatic. I don't know how to describe it. It's like a reflex kicks in and you go, okay, we're on a mission. Okay, we got, let's get this done. What do we need to do? Uh, I'm in surgery the next day uh, and they remove one of my testicles and they do a test to see the key question, which is what stage am I in? This is, this is the important part. And um, so it's a blood test. And it comes back two days later that I'm in stage 1B. Stage 1B is interesting. Uh, basically, there are four stages, if I remember correctly. Um, one being the best you could hope for. Four being it's not very good. Mm -hmm. um, and 1B is you're early, but we're just not sure if you're early enough that it's gone into your lymph nodes. And now we got a bit of an issue because from there it goes to the lungs and from the lungs it goes to the brain. So I'm just sitting there hoping. Let's, let's, let's hope. Let's see what stage let's am I? Do, let's see what we're at. So they say 1B. I go, okay. So the next thing they need to do is more blood tests and a scan. Now we're getting into CAT scans. So we do a CAT scan and this whole time, for some reason, I'm just thinking about Europe. I gotta my go to, trip. I got to get yeah. on a plane. I got to go on a plane. What am I going to do? And um, kind of going back to the part about my dad being in medical research, this whole time my dad is just boom, boom, talking to doctor, doctor, hospital, expert, this university, that university. He just, he just went on a mission. And uh, to this day, I don't know how he exactly did it because being, being a dad now um, – you know, when, when I think you can understand things a little better. Yeah. And, and he was so, he's a, he's, he's a scientific man. He's Be, a medical because man. Right? So a lot of people sometimes don't realize this. And when you're trying to explain someone, the love that we have for our kids, it's a new feeling that we learn in life until you have kids. Say, oh, I love your child. They don't know what we're talking about until the day you actually have your own yeah. child. Yeah. Is a new feeling that you develop in your life. Then especially to have two and three, that means it's always an addition. I mm -hmm. mean, your heart is getting bigger and bigger and bigger to make sure you have everybody inside. That's right. But That's I think right. our vision changed. That what happened to me when I had my first kids. Like, well, wait a minute. Now I know a lot of the things my parents were telling me. I can feel my own skin. It's like, wow. Yeah. How bad I was in bed that time. Yeah. I should be listening more. <laughs> I should be doing this. Yeah. But for you, what was that translating when you were a son <sighs> and now you are a father? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, in, it's incredible. I don't know how he, being worried about a sick child, uh, it's, it's a worst possible scenario, right? And um, yeah, he, he was, and, and the interesting thing about my experience, and I think a lot of people who have gone through something difficult or... <clears throat> traumatic have, have experienced this is you don't think about yourself, right? So I, 
I never had a moment of, well, am I going to make it out of this thing? Am I going to be okay? Never thought about. Never. Not once did I have that moment. Part of it, I think, is because my dad instilled a lot of confidence in the process. It was very, it was very managed, very processed. But also, when you go through it, you. St- I don't know why this happens, but the trigger response is, let me make sure everybody's calm. Let me make sure everybody's That okay. was from you to From me people. to them. Mm-hmm. Like making my mom feel better, making my sisters feel better, making my dad feel better. Like, everything's okay. We're going to get through it. It's going to be okay. And oh. it doesn't come from bravery or anything like that. It has nothing to do with it. It's just, it's a response almost as if, if I know you feel okay, I'll be okay. And let me ask, in, in this beginning of process you, you end up going through, to feel that on your surround you have so many great people, like in that case your family and mm. friends, mm. it was that, it's, I know it's a cheesy question, but was that very helpful no, it, to you in the whole process? It's a, very, it's a very smart question and I'll tell you why. Um, cancer is a really good filter for knowing who you're, good friends are, and who you can trust. So some stick with you, and some kind of disappear. Now, maybe it's because they feel very uncomfortable. Maybe it's because they don't know what to tell you. Um, So it's really their way of dealing with it is to just back away. But um, luckily, my support circle was as good as it could be, as good as it could be. Um, And my, my battle with cancer was long. I ended up going to Europe. I ended up going. My dad said, kid, go. Let's get the result in, but just go. If we need, we'll bring you back. And, um, and I left. And a week later, unfortunately, I got the call. You got to come back. Um, it's spread. So you have to start going through chemotherapy. So <clears throat> I stayed another two weeks is kind of what the doctor said. It's okay. Let him, we'll deal with it. Like have him spend two more weeks and then come back. So I kind of rushed the whole trip. And, uh, and I came back and I started going through chemotherapy, three rounds of BEP. Um, in that process, mm-hmm. and evidently for each person is different, how we see it, how we take that. Mm-hmm. How was your like thoughts prior, I gotta go and do chemo, I gotta go. How was that thinking? Man, cause it's not easy. No, We're no, talking no, about no, no. It's not something easy. that Am I going to come there alive or what's going to hurt me more, hurt me less? How's your, because I think it's the mind has such an important role in those situations. Yeah. Fear. Did, f- did fear kick in a lot at that point? Initially, you said that you, you were, you were no. good with it, but. No, no, fear didn't kick in. Um, I remember distinctly telling my dad at one point, I'm not looking at it as though I'm going to go to chemotherapy. I'm just calling it therapy. Like, that's my spin on it. It's therapy. The word chemo is out of the loop. Um, I would go there, kind of sit in this room, um, couches. They bring out your cocktail of drugs, and you get hooked up, and you sit there for, excuse me, for a few hours. So I would bring in books. I'd bring in movies, anything to keep my mind on anything other than the drip. And I remember one of the nurses um, once told me when I was just starting, she goes, just breathe really deep. And I said, okay, what, what do you want me to, why? She goes, well, cancer, you know, you're, you're, when you're looking at the oxygen levels and, um, you know, kind of other aspects of cancer, she goes, just cancer tends to not deal well with breath. I go, okay, that sounds really ridiculous. <laughs> um, and, and at the end of the day, I think what she was trying to tell me is like the calmer I am and the more my autoimmune system is just, strong and I'm kind of connected to my body and almost visualizing like with every drip that comes through here, this cancer is dying. You know, just kind of, I think that's what she was trying to express. And she was right because it was really helpful actually dealing with nausea and kind of everything else. Um, Just breathing and being in the moment um, was very important for me with dealing with it. And it was my first, I, I didn't know what meditation was then, but that was my first little, of self-experiment yeah, with it w- before w- knowing i was also yep. asking about these and we had that conversation prior is there anything that you come up with as a, a phrase 
some kind of a meditation yourself yeah. that stick with you until today's time. And yeah. you can tell looking back, like, man, that was very powerful for me. It was was made the difference for me to, yeah. to go through this whole process. Yeah, so that that's that's fast forward um, a few. So uh, let me tell take you to the next stage, and I'll connect the dots. So um, we had ended up uh, going through this process for about uh, eighteen months. Man, that's and a very long journey. I mean, eighteen months. It's, lo- it's long, and it's not just the length; it's the not knowing what's going to be next, which is the difficult. uncertainty. The uncertainty. Yeah. yeah, the uncertainty of is it, did we get it? Did we not get it? And at the end of 18 months, we realized, okay, so there's no more cancer, but unfortunately, there's this benign tumor that I had that needed to get taken out. And unfortunately, it was in a very bad place um, within, within my stomach cavity, and it required a, a nine-hour surgery. Incredibly delicate surgery. You're talking about moving everything, in, you know. In, um, this whole, in this whole process, I'm sure we have some days that we're up, and have some days that not so much. Mm. How was that for you in the days that we're not on the, the best of our mindset? Is that, if, is that, was kind of a day like that? Because 18 months, man, and showing it's, up it's and long, going yeah. day in, day out, day in, day out, it's, it's not for anybody that has that willing. It's yeah. not for everyone that has that strength. That's why I think your whole surround, and especially that shows to you as a person how strong you are. So um, there were definitely days that were very low. A lot of it, maybe not even related to how I'm feeling, could have been, you know, I see friends moving to New York City. They have their apartments. They're going to work. And I'm just... I can't get out of bed. You're kind of on pause. <laughs> I and can't everyone get out of bed. Is, yeah. yeah. And I, and I, and I feel like shit and I'm throwing up and I'm, my head is this big and I'm totally bald. And so there were very, very bad days. Um, by kind of by definition, I'm, I tend to be more pessimistic in general. I think a lot of people tend to be, I read this, um, study once that 75% of human emotions are negative emotions. And the reason that that is, if you kind of look back, is that, well, listen, as, as a caveman, you, you shouldn't be optimistic. You should be pretty pessimistic. You should be worried about whether there's a tiger in that cave or whether the bear is going to eat you. So if you want to survive, you need to be pretty negative. So, <laughs> I understand. Some people don't realize that when we're dealing with fear, it's always something that we imagine first. It's yes. not even there yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, we are kind of putting ourselves in a situation that might not even exist that's or right. would happen. That's right, that's and right. And I think in this whole process with you is, is there any moments that through this whole 18 months I went through, people through your everyday talking to that said something that stick with you is like, man, I always need to hear that. The most influential um, person, I never met him, um, um, never got a chance to say thank you. He went through some bad <coughs> press afterwards. Um, but Armstrong, the, the cyclist, um, he went through testicular cancer and he wrote a book about it. And... Um, And uh, that got me through it, reading his experience, what he went through, um, and kind of everything that he said, which I could have, I was literally living my experience through his experience. You were able to relate it to that story. Yeah, Lance Lance Armstrong was was definitely like the biggest influence I had then, because you can't really, what are you going to tell somebody who has, like, keep your head up, hey, it's going to be okay. Yeah, sure, but... You didn't, you're not going through this. Yeah. Don't talk to yeah, me about yeah, it. Like yeah. uh, that was easier from outside. Hey, yeah. I gotta do yeah. this. I gotta do that. Yeah, yeah. and people tried, you know. But it, it, reading about somebody else who had gone through it and made it out the other end to win the Tour de France, and then having another round of cancer, uh, and reading about his, his experiences because I had to go to a CAT scan every three weeks, and you have to drink this disgusting thing, and you have to go in there, and you feel like crap, and and then here I am reading a book about him doing the exact same thing. And I go, ah, okay, I can, I got this. Like I can, I can do this. So that was very helpful to me. 
And it inspired me that when I finished cancer, I kind of looked around and I go, okay, what am I, I'm at the end. Now I got to, I have to do follow-ups. So this sucks because I have more uncertainty. Is it going to come back? Is it not going to come back? What am I going to do? And I decided I need to do something big. Like I need to do something that I'm going to prove to myself that I'm healthy. And I looked around and I said, what am I going to do? I'm going to run a marathon. So I, I, well, that's awesome. I moved to New York, still bald, you know, barely any energy and uh, hooked up with a charity group that raises money um, as part of their marathon run and started training for the 2004 New York City Marathon. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I did it. And the next year I did it again. I ran the marathon again. Not, you know, just to jog it. That's it. But just, just to prove to yourself. Just to prove to myself that I'm healthy, that I can do it. And that I can, at this point, I'm looking for things that are hard to do. Like I'm looking for anything that's hard to do. I think and after this, everything else is easy, man. I think so most you, of you, you, you've you been look for a, yeah, you look for a mountain to climb, you know, you look for something that you go, you I want a higher mountain. I want to, I want to abuse myself and I want to come out the other side. This is all I want to do right now. So I started doing triathlons and with ocean swims and with lake swims and kind of doing all these different things just to put my th myself through hell and then just come out because I felt great coming out of it. I felt you so good. You felt those steps made you a lot stronger, knowing that you've been in the very yeah. slow as a human can be in health-wise. Yeah. Now you're in a try swimming, running, back then. Yeah. You went from zero to 100. Yes, exactly. In a way that, I don't know, not many people, but I think it's a, it's a lesson we learn in life that we can do it. Yeah. And uh, one of the greatest things is having you here telling all of this and I don't know it's thinking about that did you ever thought that could be a problem for you like having kids in the future or anything absolutely. like that absolutely and thankfully when they finished the surgery they were like listen we did it like you're okay you can have kids how many and kids do you have today I have four four amazing um yeah I think the youngest one is what, three, <sighs> three four months old? The youngest one is two months, going to be two months old. I'm very, very, very lucky. Very lucky. Um, you know, thinking about them is really, I can talk about cancer and I can talk about everything, but thinking about them is, that's where I get emotional. So um, I think that that's how we get, we know how rich we are in life. <sighs> I think, I think you're right. To our kids and the family yeah. is like, man, yeah, they are part of me, my a continuation in life. Yeah, they, you know, they're the hardest thing that I, being a father, right? So you can get cancer is hard and moving around is hard and all these challenges, but being a dad is the, just the hardest challenge ever. They test everything in me, my patience, my empathy, you know, um, they, they, they grow it from that place. We, you we know? never stop learning life. Yeah. Yeah, it's an everyday learning process. Every day, every I'm I'm a white belt in uh, fatherhood. Every I every, think every so. day, every day getting better, little by little. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. And um, what would you say to someone that is about to go to the process you already been through? It's been already how many years since that? Twenty years past. Uh, it has been twenty. Yes, exactly. Twenty, 20 years. years. Yeah. What would you say to someone who is, is about to start, someone that is through the whole process, someone that's not feeling on their 100%? What would you can say and tell them to, you know what, being there, done that, yeah. and those few things that that's a good made question. me go through, and uh, here I am telling you that it helped me, and I believe that can help you. That's a good question. Um, I'm a... I'm a big believer that you cannot manage what you can't measure. So meaning anything in life, if for me at least, starting a business or teaching a jujitsu class or whatever it is you're going to do, including probably the biggest fight of your life if you're sick or going through a divorce or going through anything difficult, um, things are much easier when you can kind of plan them. And you can kind of say, okay, listen, this thing is chaos right now. This is sheer hell. 
There's so many uncertainties. I don't know what's going to happen or how this is going to unfold. So let me break it down into little bite-sized pieces that I can manage. And uh, once you kind of organize it and stick to a plan, that you can then say, okay, tomorrow, here's my objective for tomorrow. I'm, I'm just going to go see this doctor or I'm just going to talk to this lawyer or I'm just going to put this business plan together, whatever it is. That's tomorrow. Get through tomorrow, check it off the list. You feel better. You know you did. Okay, here's my plan for Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. And I think plans are what give us kind of this disciplinary framework to be able to feel like we're achieving something and it gives us the space to feel some form of happiness or whatever positive emotion you get from, you know. It's almost like it's a daily setup for your goals. Yes, exactly. For today. You kind of hold yourself accountable. Yeah, I think it, accountable and, and, and less pressure because you know, okay, it's on paper. Mm -hmm. Here's my plan. Here's what I need to do. This is how I'm going to tackle it. So for me, it was just, hey, just show up for chemotherapy. That, that's it. And then my next thing is this. And then my next thing is that. There's the uh, expression, you know, the, the only way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time. It's the only way to deal with any, you know, immense event in your life. Just one little piece at a time, one little piece at a time. Do you, feel that ex do you feel that experience empowered you in some way? And the reason why I ask this is because Lance Armstrong is a good example. I mean, all the other stuff aside, he went from cancer survivor to an elite athlete. Mm -hmm. I mean, elite. Um, there's a gentleman on the, in the jiu-jitsu circuit. I've competed against him. Professor Mark has competed against him. Uh, he's a black belt. He's a cancer survivor. And he said something very poignant to us. He goes, before I got cancer, I'd win, I'd lose. He goes, I wasn't really, it was after I got cancer, I never lost. Cause he's like one of the number one in our weight class, age wow. division, you know, he's uh, in his fifties and he is, he's a really powerful competitor. But he said that he goes before cancer, eh, after I never lost. Yeah. It gives you a superpower for sure. And, and the superpower is just your worst day. It's not my worst day. Like th there's nothing that you can do that I haven't been through something that was more difficult, um, more challenging. And, and I may very well lose. Uh, I lose a lot. Not, I'm not even talking about jujitsu. Like I fail so many times at different things that I try to do. But, but next time you go back and do better. Next time I just better. go back. Just, you as know, a, dust as it a off. curiosity, yeah. let me, in most families, our parents, they have some kind of a line on their profession, doctors and what made you, you switch, you go to a different direction than your dad? Mm. Now you're in a law firm and your dad is a doctor. It's like, okay, I, yeah. I don't know if because I had to deal with this issue or I don't know. I don't want to, I see how hard it is my dad and how he works. I want to go a different route. Yeah. No, it, it had nothing that? to do with, with, with the work. Um, so I ended up moving to New York and I was always... Um, I didn't know you were a teacher, man. I didn't yep. know that. Mm -hmm. I know. Yeah. Pretty so amazing. Yeah. Right? Like I, I got the benefit of teaching. Um, I don't know what generation that is of uh, third, uh, third year college yeah. students. And it's amazing how things have changed yeah. since I was in college. You're but teaching them how to do business. Yeah, I'm teaching them entrepreneurship. So I'm basically teaching them. But um, you should have that since kindergarten. People <laughs> understand how to, to do business. That should be part of yeah. our... Uh, yeah, today part of the program. Today things are a little different. You know, the the information at their fingertips is something that I never. Oh, yeah, I yeah. mean, it's incredible. They sit there in class, and you know, I ask a question. Well, I've got an I've got an answer. Okay, so what I ended up doing is I changed the curriculum a little bit, and I started doing cases of things that I'm working on. So a merger or a capital raise or um, an IPO. And I said, okay, well, we have this company and here's what it looks like and here's what they produce. And they want to raise money. Like, how do they raise money? I don't know. How do you raise money? Well, what would you do, right? And I started like working them through my cases um, or through my, my transactions so that they can have some real life um, connection to what they're doing, which is more interesting than reading from a textbook, I thought. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know? um, so I apologize. I forgot. Oh, where no, going no, with it. no, uh, no. And I would just, you chose a different path, oh, than, a your different path. than your dad. Yeah. So uh, I, when I moved to New York, um, I kind of did just random things for two years, just figuring out what I want to do. I had the weirdest jobs. And, uh, but I always, I had this like 
image of business, like New York business, like all the money and the suits and everything. And I was like, I want to, I want to do that. And I didn't know how to do it. And one day I kind of, you know, walked by and I saw law school. I said, man, I should go to law school. And I asked my dad, should I go to law school? And my parents were like, yeah, go to law school. I go, okay, I'll go to law school. And then I don't care about the law at all, but I'll go to law school. And then the first day at law school, they go, um, you shouldn't be here if you don't want to be a lawyer. You want to, you don't want to practice law. I go, man, I'm in the wrong place, but all right, let's, let's grind this out anyway. So <laughs> textbooks like this, and this is exactly what I knew how to do. This is like grind every day, hours, hours, you sleep it, you breathe it, you eat law school. It's the hard, it's so hard. Um, but when I finished, I ended up getting a job at a wall street firm, which did exactly what I wanted to do, which is this whole transactions and how do you do it and working with boards of directors and management teams and raising, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And I love, I loved it. I loved it because I, I was, I was very motivated. So I would always walk around with like a little notebook from office to office. Hey, do you need anything? Do you need anything? And they loved that because usually associates try to escape out of work. I wanted work. And um, you're looking for more work. I'm looking for more work. Give me more. Give me more. It's the same thing as the marathon, right? Give me hell and let me get through it, you know? And, um, but I was very entrepreneurial. And so very quickly, I started developing my own clients as a, even as a second year associate. And, which is not very common. And nobody really knew how to digest that, right? Like, but you're supposed to work on our clients. And by the time I was a, uh, I think a third or fourth year, I was basically just doing my own thing there. And eventually I just decided to start my own law firm. And that's what I did in 2010, right before Miley was, two months before Miley was born, I started the firm and I go, I turn to my wife, I go, am I crazy? Like, am I nuts to do this two months before we're going to have a kid? Like, is this really what? And um, my wife's dad and, and my dad were both like, we got gotcha. you. You know, you're, you're, you're not going to fall. Like, it's going to be okay. Do it. This is your chance to do it. I think everybody mm-hmm. look at you you're crazy, but I think all the people yeah. that succeed in life, a lot of people look at them crazy. A few years go down the road, like yeah. man, he was right. Yeah, I think so. He was right. Well, you know this. You have to take you have to take huge risks uh, if you wanna if yeah. you wanna make it big. Life Who is knows every, this but you? A, everyday challenge and bring it on. What can we do? That's it. Bring it on. And now going through all this process and this challenge in life, how was the beginning of your jujitsu life? So, how is it? How did you end up uh, going to Jiu Jitsu? Just thinking about it, I smile, you know. It's like, man, (laughs) that's what I want to hear. I want to choke people when I get choked. I want to help. How did that happen? How is it walking into this facility? And okay, let's let's try this now. So, I had no idea what Jiu Jitsu was. (laughs) I never watched UFC. I don't have that story. Like, I didn't watch Hoist, you know, back then. Um, Didn't hear about the Gracies. Nothing. And when I started, uh, when I started being an attorney, I realized very quickly I was getting a little bit amped up, and my body was pretty broken from cancer, uh, obviously, but also the marathons. They they took their toll on my hips and uh, just my body in general. And I started doing yoga, and very quickly, just like everything else in my life, I'm very like I see something, like I want to do something. I look up. We're gonna do it. Here we go. Um, so. I got into yoga really hard and started doing it every day and really, really, really was passionate about it and really loved this idea of connection and breath and movement and everything. And about 2014, a friend of mine, you know, I'm telling him, hey, you should come to yoga with me. And he goes, uh, well, you should come to jujitsu with me. And I go, What's jujitsu? And he goes, well, I basically like hold people on the ground. I said, oh, doesn't sound appealing to me at all in any <laughs> sense, but um, I did a little judo. I mean, and I do a lot of yoga, so you better be careful because I'm pretty strong. Like you know, I'll 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 train. I'm I'm, I'm probably going to beat you. And he goes, okay, so come with me. It's December thirtieth, and he goes, okay, come with me on the first. We're closed, but January first we're open. And so I, in the meantime, I'm googling jujitsu, and then obviously what comes up, choke, right? So I watch the documentary, and I go, ah, oh, it's pretty cool. This guy, this guy Hickson's pretty, pretty impressive. And he takes me and um, where does he take me to? To Henzo's Academy and in New Jersey, this one in New Jersey. And we go and I show up like, hey guys, I, I, I 
train yoga, you know, like better, better be careful. And so we do the warm ups and we do the whole thing. And then they, he lets me roll, right? The, the professor at the time lets me roll. And he puts me with a purple belt that's probably 130 pounds, maybe 125 pounds. And I go, okay, what do you want me to do? He's like, well, just, just, you know, just try to keep up and maybe try to get me on my back or something. And I have no idea what happened. I, I to this day, <laughs> I just see like a helicopter. And then for some reason, something feeling like a truck sitting on my chest. And I'm like, I'm just going to bench this guy off. And I cannot move the guy off of me. And he just, the force, the gravity, like the pressure. When I left that day, I was like, I have to figure out what the hell that was. Like, what just happened? This guy weighs nothing. I was probably 175 pounds. This guy is nothing. What just happened? And I was hooked. I was hooked. And I remember like the room was silent and I'm groaning and I'm like, ah, uh, everybody's <laughs> like, and it's just quiet. And I was like, that's so cool. I have to figure this out. So that was my first experience. And I haven't looked back since. I mean, I'm, I'm hooked. Um, I try to do it so I don't get injured these days. So I'm, I try not to overtrain and I'm very, if you roll with me, you know, I kind of go slower, but, um, I'd rather that, that's not a, get injured. That's, than not, that's <laughs> now how we feel when you roll here. I feel, yeah, I feel no. like a truck on top yeah. of us. No, <laughs> not you, not your turn to be the truck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's an amazing, and um, how, an amazing how was that transition New York to LA? Oh man. I, what, what took us so long? What took us so long? We, um, before we came here, I used to, this is the days when I used to travel for work and I would always take a gi in my bag and train at different academies. And uh, when my wife and I decided we, we should go to uh, move to California, then you know, I packed my gi and I went to every academy, um, or at least most. And um, Los Angeles is obviously the mecca of jujitsu. And I remember coming here, or at least to the old academy, and I said, this is my home. Like, I, I, right away I knew this is my home. Like, this is where I belong. This academy, this area, this weather, these people, like, this feels right, you know? So it's been amazing, you know? Man, and Jonathan, what would be this whole process, something that through your life experience, because... I think every one of us do have an incredible story in our life, and regardless of how old we are. And evidently, through such a young age, you face already, to me, is, man, when people say cancer, the first thing comes to my mind is like, man, am I going to die or something? Am I dealing with death now? I don't want to die. And a lot of people, I'm sure each one has a different feeling on that aspect. And amazingly, you have something that, not even worry about you, <laughs> you worry about the other people too. Hey, I'm okay, stay calm and I'm good. What would you say to someone? What would you, this whole process, some, I don't know, a phrase or something that stick and uh, tell somebody? Ooh, um, I don't have any, uh, I don't have any quick uh, kind of motivational phrases that I can really think of. Um, over time, I, I can share with you that um, yoga is still a big part of my life. Meditation is probably even a bigger part of my life these days, just trying to be mindful and aware of what's happening. Um, and I kind of developed my own little, um, I don't know if it's a mantra, but every day I need to put myself in the right frame of mind when I wake up so that I can have the best day that I could possibly have. And uh, I don't mind kind of sharing what I tell myself every day, if you, that would be helpful. Oh, uh, definitely. So the, the kind of phrases of what I take myself through are first, uh, just show up. That's kind of my first rule of um, how I go about my life, which is wherever you need to go, show up, meaning be there. Like despite if you're uncomfortable or I'm tired to go to jujitsu or I'm nervous about going to something, an event or a meeting, just show up because it's such a big part of the whole experience to get something, to get through something, to get something done, to achieve something, just show up. So many people just 
they find an excuse and I'm, I'm allergic to excuses, like just allergic to them. If I hear it from my kids or if I hear it from anybody or a client, I'll, I can't just show up. Um, and then the next kind of part of my, myself saying is be present, grateful and humble. So once you show up, be there, like, don't be on, don't be texting. Don't think about other meetings. That's a great thing about jujitsu. You have to be here if you're here. Like oh. you can't think about work out there. You can't think about your relationships. Your, your, your partner will remind you all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. You're here, but you're not here. Yeah. <laughs> the choke is on. That's it. That's it. And you always tell us, like, close your eyes, feel it. Like, man, I love that. I love it. I roll so many times, just close my eyes. And I listen to you. I hear your voice. They're like, just feel it. And you have to be here, which is so beautiful. And man, in, um, in all of these, and I, I ask that too, for some people, easy to answer. For a lot of people might have some pause moments. Who is Jonathan Sketcher? Uh, um, that's, a, that's a wide question. Um, I think I, I'm going to be the one that pauses. That's um, okay, man. Take your time. I think that I am, I mean, who am I? I'm a, I'm a culmination of my experiences over life. Right. That's that's who I think I am, at least. And uh, at certain phases in my life, I was a I was a fighter. Right. I, I had to fight cancer or fight adversity like everybody. Um, I'm not special in that way at all. Um, so I think I'm a fighter. At another phase, I was a survivor that has its own identity issues. Um, another phase, I was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a father. Um, so you have to start thinking about being beyond yourself. You're not the center of the universe. I should have learned that lesson many, many years ago. But um, so I think I'm, I'm somebody that changes and grows over time with each of these experiences. So again, I say cancer was good. It was good because despite how tough it was, it made me who I am today. Adversity makes us who we are today. I'm a very strong believer in that. I think many people who train jujitsu feel that way, probably. One of your greatest teachers. Yeah. Adversity. Exactly. Failures are excellent. Mm -hmm. like failures are the best. Um, so I, I think I'm a culmination of these experiences, and I hope, I try to stay very curious. I try to stay very interested in things and, and, and grow with them. And I will, if you don't mind, I'm going to make some addition into Jonathan. I think it's, uh, if you know you and for the time that you've been here with us, a gentleman, someone that through this whole process of life, the way you see life today and the way you make everybody feel important around you. And I think it's this whole process and experience that you have and you're showing here every time I come to the school, the reasons that why you're successful on the mat and outside the mat. I think for us is everyone that comes here has a, a, an incredible story and uh, you are one of the ones that knowing you, that being, I don't know many people that have been through what you've been through and the way you're taking that and uh, it's incredible. I think Thank it's... This is beyond any a black belt or coral belt. I think the way, because we're not talking about just the achievement outside. I think you achieved something so high in your personal life. And uh, well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, very us, much. Man. Amazing Thank story. Thank, Thank you. It's, it's something Thank you. that it's it's real. You are a real person. You're somebody who's been through some challenging, tough times. And this is beyond coral belt, man. This is above any belt I could ever imagine out there having here sit next to someone and surviving being such an incredible mood and uh, an example here for us. Uh, thank you. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for that opportunity to be here. And um, thank you for it's great to this have you here, man. Yeah. I mean, not the funnest of topics, but uh, it was man, fun it, to be able to talk about I, it. I think it's the whole idea of behind what we do is to have people like you here that makes a difference in the world out there. I get a lot of... I didn't mean to cut you off, John Jack, but I, I personally, I get a lot of um, messages through social media. I just listened to the podcast. It was this episode. You know, you don't know me, but this is what I'm going through. And thank you. Wow. Like it, it made a difference. So, wow. yeah, the, these and stories help. And uh, you have 
you you will now, but you have no idea how how important to have real people like you telling the view from inside of mm. such a challenge. Yeah. How much people be out there and have such an incredible positive impact. Thank the, you for you to make the difference. Yeah, for sure. And the, the amazing thing is that this podcast is like an extension of the school in the sense that of all of the academies I've been at, I've never walked into a place which should be intimidating by nature and felt so at home and so calm. And that's the messages that, that you give and that Jay gives, meaning that, hey, guys, respect each other. You're at home now. And this podcast is exactly an extension of that, right? It's feeling... You have this ability of letting people feel very comfortable and let their guards down. So thank you for letting me do that and letting me share. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone out there. And man, this is No Gear Required podcast. These kind of uh, conversations are the reasons that we have this podcast. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you very so much. Thank you. Hey, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. See you guys soon.